So a couple of months ago, we had our diaconate retreat up north, and we had a speaker. He was the uh, head of the diaconate of the United States, and he told us that, you know, when we signed up for the diaconate, we came in with the idea that we would be submissive to uh, the bishop, obedient to what he wanted, and to our pastors. And um, this past week, Father Matt said to me, um, why don't you not preach from behind the ambo this week and step out in front without notes? And I said, yes, Father, yes. <laughs> so pray for me. This is the third week, uh, third Sunday in Ordinary Time, and we take time today to reflect on the Word, to um, see its glory that has given us, especially in the Bible. And last week we said if you have a Bible and you want it blessed, to bring it to today's Mass. Um, you can always come and have your Bible blessed by us, but it's a special week, weekend, to really reflect on how powerful the Word is in our lives. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John tells us that Jesus was with God, and he was the Word, and he is God. And the Bible tells this great story of Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, all living as one and loving us so much. Now the Bible is God's little love letters to us, people have said. Some people say that the letters B-I-B-L-E stand for Basic Instruction Before Leaving Earth. It's not a bad acronym. We get a lot of information from this little book. And this little book has been sold, to date they figure over 5 billion copies of the Bible have been sold. And every year, a hundred plus million are continuing to be sold. People are searching, they're searching for the truth. And the truth is God. And we can find that in his words, the divinely inspired words in this Bible. There's a podcast that Father Mike Schmidt started last year. It's called Bible in a Year. 365 days of reading a couple of chapters a day and then explaining what he's read, where it's, why it was written, how the people of the time took it, what they needed. And it was the most popular podcast. There's something like 850,000 podcasts produced a year. And in January of last year and January of this year so far, it is the most popular um, downloaded podcast on the internet of spiritual and religious uh, podcasts. So people are hungry for the word. We have it here. We listen in three different ways, I believe. And we listen and we hear with three different ways. We hear with our minds, we hear with our hearts, and we hear with our soul. When we hear with our minds, we try to examine what a word is and, and how it reflects and, and where it fits into our vocabulary. And, we compare it and start tearing it apart and trying to figure out what that word means to us. And when we listen with our hearts, we start to take into, the, into ourselves what that word is trying to say to us. And we allow it to start to move us into a direction that we may not necessarily want to go. And when we listen with our souls, then we have a conversation with God about this word that he's presented before us. And we start having these relations with him to be able to move in the direction that he wants us to and mold us. And the Bible is filled with plenty of words that we can listen to with our minds, our hearts, and our souls. It's filled with poetry and prose, essays and songs and psalms. It has biographies and fiction. It's loaded with stories of love and hate of war and peace, it has stories of intimacy, it has stories of joy and ecstasy, stories about wars that have taken place and wars that are yet to come, stories about angels and demons. Everything's in here. You don't need to look elsewhere in literature. Time magazine said in 2017 that the Bible has done more for literature, culture, 
entertainment than any other book in history. So, we should be a little more attentive maybe to what the Word has to say to us in this Bible. Back in 2017, July, I met a couple. I knew them very well, but they came to me and they asked me a special request. They were a senior couple and they said that um, their grandson, we'll call him Jack, was interested in his faith journey and he was spending a lot of time with that. But he had a lot of questions about the Catholic Church and its roots and its beliefs. And coming from being baptized in an uh, Orthodox Catholic, um, but then practicing in a Protestant faith, he had a lot of questions. And they said, we're struggling answering them. Would I be interested in trying to communicate with him and answer them? And I thought, well, I'm a deacon in the church. I know our faith pretty well. I've been Catholic my whole life. Sure, how, how hard could that be? Well, this young man, age 15 at the time, laid out a whole doctrine in front of me saying, these are your beliefs from what I understand. How do you respond to them? And then his grandparents proceeded to tell me that, oh, when you go and visit him, he has like seven different versions of the Bible strewn over his bed. He has Greek and Hebrew translations so that he can figure out what the words exactly were. And I'm like, you could have told me this before you. I <laughs> said yes. But we began to engage in communication via email. And we spoke back and forth about the questions about our faith. Where is the Pope in the Bible? Why do we worship Mary? Why do we talk to the saints the way we do? And all kinds of great questions eloquently posed. And it really challenged me and helped me learn more about my faith as well. And we went back and forth. And I said to him at one point, I said in my emails, I remember I said, Dom, you know, you're very well educated, I can tell, with the mind. You're listening and you're hearing with your mind. And you're tearing apart every word, word for word. And that is very common with Protestants and known as sola scriptura. We only need the Bible. We don't need anything else. And I said, in the Catholic Church, we have a thing called tradition, capital T, tradition, things that we have learned passed on from age to age. And I tried to share some of those traditions with him. Um, where did they come from? And I said, well, if you look back at the early church fathers, you'll see that they wrote about the church in 50 AD, 100 AD, 200 AD. They were followers of the people who were right behind Christ. They learned what the church, and it says, and, and if you look at that, it looks a lot like what the church is today. And it seemed at that time that he insisted that, well, I think the word alone is enough. And I remember giving him an example. I said, now, Jack, if your grandparents passed away, and 20 years later someone wanted to write a story about them, and they looked up their grandparents, they might find an obituary. And in that obituary, there'd be a nice little reflection of they were part of the St. Michael community. They loved to go to divine dinner dates with Deacon Eric and Laura Lambert. They loved their community. They sang in the foot. Whatever the, those things that they know were historically correct. But then they would see that you were listed, Jack, as the grandson, and you're still alive. And they come and find you, and they ask you the question, what was your grandparents like? I'm sure you'd have a much broader and more accurate story about your grandparents than what they would ever find written just in the Word. I think we came to an impasse at that point because I feel as though Jack had decided that he wanted to just keep examining with his mind and the heart wasn't ready to hear yet. So we decided to break off communication. I hadn't met Jack yet. But in that fall and going into the winter of that year, we were talking about a conference for St. Michael Parish. And our conversation together greatly inspired the idea that we bring in a Catholic apologist, one who could explain the faith very eloquently, one with five master's degree in theology and great debater and, and all these forums of Protestant versus Catholicism versus any other religion out there. And this guy was great. His name was Trent Horn. And Trent came to our parish in the fall of 2018. 
And this young man, Jack, called his grandparents and said, did you know that you have this guy, Trent Horn, coming to your parish? I want to go. And so he came. And that was the first time that I met Jack in person. And we had a nice little conversation. He listened to Trent Horn. I think he even had aspirations of trying to trip up Trent Horn. And I was like, well, that'll be a big one. But he left the conference with as much material as he could afford to buy that day and started doing more research, more listening with his mind. I didn't hear from Jack for another 12, 10 months or so. Time had gone on, and we went, my wife and I had gone up to Newport, New Hampshire for a weekend with a priest friend of ours, and I preached for the weekend with him, and something in the gospel or something in the word inspired myself and my wife both to think of, and we always continue to pray for Jack, but we were thinking of him that weekend. And Sunday, on our ride back, my wife asked me, have you heard from Jack or anything about him? And I said, no, I was just thinking about him today, too. He's on my heart. And we got home, and we unpacked, and sat down, and started relaxing, grabbed a cup of tea, and I opened up my laptop, and I looked at my email, and there was an email from Jack. And the title of the email said, I want to be Catholic. Now he was listening with his heart. And now he was allowing the Spirit to move him in a direction toward God. I had all I could do to get through the email. I was bawling. I'm like reading it to my wife and saying, oh my gosh. And he put it so articulately. He said, I went to Mass with my grandparents, and I'm so impressed by the reverence that you have as Catholics for the Word. That, and I was so impressed with how much it is involved, how much Scripture goes through your Mass, the Old Testament, the Psalms, the New Testament, the Gospel, it's so involved in your Mass. And then at the sacrifice, at the altar, when Jesus offers himself, he said, I began to tremble, and I couldn't stop until the host was put back in the tabernacle at the end. And then we knew he's listening with his soul. God has a way of moving us. God, if we allow it, when we start trying to figure things out with our mind, when we start listening with our heart, and we open up our soul to him, he will move us, and we'll come to understand the great miracle it was that the word became flesh and took upon himself the sins and transgressions of every human being, past, present, and future, and then offered himself to the Father as the perfect sacrifice so that we may have eternal life in heaven with him. Going back to some of the early church fathers and listening to today's gospel, I found a passage by St. Origen. I want to read that and share that with you today. St. Origen says, Blessed is that congregation of which Scripture testifies that the eyes of all were fixed on him. How much would I wish that this assembly gave such testimony? I wish that the eyes of all, of catechumens, faithful women, men, and children, not the eyes of the body, but the eyes of the soul, would gaze upon Jesus. For when you look to him, your faces will be shining from the light of his gaze. You will be able to say, the light of your face, O Lord, has made its mark upon us. Maybe we should ask ourselves, when's the last time that we gazed intently upon the Lord? How much we open our hearts up to the word being read. How much we look upon him as we approach Holy Communion and receive him intimately within ourselves. Then he can claim that Today, this scripture passage has been fulfilled in your hearing.